Hello there again. Welcome back to Animal Nutrition Unit. Things and as we change to our objectives slide here, we're going to outline and discuss really the life cycle feeding approach to beef cattle. Um, we'll identify specific nutrient and additive needs where they're appropriate, uh, what specifically you need for different phases as we go through from a calf uh, to a finishing steer. Uh, replacement heifer and a brood cow and then we'll look at understanding uh, feeding systems you know what's available out there what are good choices in terms of feeding systems for cattle those are objectives uh, in real brief for the as we change to the next slide and transition let's start with the cow herd and really the main focal point when you're talking about being a cow calf producer is having a high calf crop percentage each year. Remember that gestation length is about 280 days plus or minus a few depending on which breed that you have. So it's very important that recovery and rebreeding should occur within 80 to 85 days after breed after calving time, so postpartum. So in order to get that accomplished, no, you have to have a few things in mind. So that really critical time, as you see at the bottom of the slide here, is 30 days pre-partum or pre-calving to about 70 days post-calving. Your nutritional program really needs to be on point through that transitional time, that 100-day span there. Um, your goal as a producer, as a nutritionist, um, is to have cows slightly gaining weight before breeding time and you'll have higher conception rates and shorter time to first heat. So the goal is that you minimize then body weight loss, you manage that a little bit. They are going to lose a little bit of body weight as they have a calf, they're nursing a calf along, that calf is is uh, using utilizing nutrients and milk that that cow produces through her ration uh, in order to grow itself. So that cow will sacrifice a little bit of body weight in order to feed the baby. Now the critical thing is that you don't let that carry on just too long. You, it's, it's normal for them to lose some amount of weight, but uh, if you allow an animal to lose, let's say a full body condition score or 100 pounds or more, they're probably going to not be quite as fertile whenever that, uh, whenever you'd like to be breeding them. So uh, the more effective feeding programs will have cows slightly gaining weight right as they develop that that first heat cycle maybe let's say 30 days to 45 days after calving and then be really ready to breed about day 60 70 80 in there so that you have them all hopefully bred within the first two or three heat cycles after calving but nutrition has a huge influence on that reproductive efficiency so of course, then uh, most cow calf producers will choose one of two calving programs, either a spring calving program uh, upcoming here next month in March and through the April time period. Hopefully, they can get the majority of their herd to calve in those two months, or a September October calving period. So, either way, you want to avoid severe cold or severe heat stress. Uh, there's a table in your book, uh, table 8-4, that gives you a lot of really good nutritional guidelines on feeding the cow-calf, uh, those brood cows out there. I would reference you to that if you're, if you're interested in more specifics, and we'll utilize that when we get to our project. But the main goal, like, like we say, is to avoid severe cold or severe heat stress. Those March and April calvers, and generally the reason that they choose that is pasture is going to be a main cog in their ration program. So then that kind of sets up a little bit of the approach the entire rest of the way is, is how are we going to supplement and effectively uh, feed those calves and those cows as they go through then the spring and summer months and into the fall. Um, what's going to need to be supplied to them in order to maximize the efficiency of pasture and the cost effectiveness of pasture out there uh, in your production systems. The reason that you find some that will calve in September and October is that gives them a little bit more control of that uh, calf through the, through the calving process and what ration program they might be on. Um, they're probably going to be a, a bit more uh, feed involved in those type of programs. Uh, maybe more confinement, so to speak, or maybe you just you have a producer that uh, that you know wants to take advantage of a little bit different pricing opportunity in order to supply calves to feed lots at a different 
period of the year. So it really depends on what's available to your producer and what they prefer in terms of which calving season works for them the best. But really ration nutrition content as we kind of finish up on this slide really depends on the frame size and condition of that uh, those cows out there in the pasture. Uh, what stage of production and environment that you have. So for example when we have um, cows that are all bred out there hopefully we've got proper con body condition on them and then hopefully environmentally they've got some protection from the wind they're not stressed with a lot of mud uh, all those cause challenges for cattle out there that are in the pasture situation so um, and especially when we start talking about temperature changes and temperature stress on animals we need to support Here's a brief chart that I put together that gives you some real basic guidelines uh, for ration composition, pregnant cows and lactating cows. Um, kind of taking a few things out of the textbook here and putting it in a chart format. Those of you who might have a few uh, cow-calf uh, situations out there, you might reference this slide right here in order to help yourself balance a ration. And, and we'll probably reference back to this whenever we start putting together some rations on our, on our own. When you transition then to summertime and think about those cows out there on pasture, hopefully it's going to supply most of your needed nutrients. If you've done a good job putting your pasture together, a nice blend of grasses that come along early in the spring, you have nice lush growth and a blend of different uh, grasses that come on at different times and a few legumes out there in order to support cattle uh, from a protein perspective. And then on top of that, rotational graze allows uh, you to be even more efficient yet. Uh, but try and have a nice blend of grasses, the cool season, warm season, and then some legumes mixed in. Uh, and you will be quite successful with some pasture feeding programs. More than likely, you're going to need some supplemental minerals out there. And you say, well, what might we need and how would we supplement are two questions listed here on our slide. Uh, a lot of it depends on your soil test and the types of grasses that you're growing. Um, Beef cattle out on pasture typically will need some supplemental magnesium. Grass tetany is a disease that can be developed through uh, hypomagnesia in cattle, and, the, and cattle will go down and act a little goofy and have uh, uh, episodes of what we call like stargazing, which is a little bit of a, almost like a, uh, a seizure that they may have. And they can go down with low blood magnesium. And so magnesium is sometimes a, a mineral that we need to supplement. Uh, certainly then your micro minerals or your trace minerals need to be supplemented. And you say, well, how might we be able to do that? Well, you see a number of different options out there. Uh, very popular in this area is a very simple uh, lick tub or lick, uh, lick block out there that you can throw out in the pasture that may carry a bit of protein and molasses in it. And then is a, is a big supplier of, of uh, uh, macro and micro mineral packages. You could also just simply pour out some mineral in a tub and allow it to, to be free choice consumed out there. And cattle will generally only eat whatever they prefer at any point in time and, and kind of will somewhat regulate it themselves. Supplemental energy really should only be provided if pasture is inadequate, you don't have enough pasture space or doesn't have a good quality pasture. Uh, for example, milk, uh, production cows, cows with a calf on their side are probably going to make between 10 and 25 pounds of milk per day for about that 200 day period while they've got a calf by their side. So it might be advantageous for you. Uh, or you may need to if you don't have enough adequate pasture to feed something like a little bit of silage or a little bit of corn grain or something energy based distillers whatever you can get that's that's economically feasible uh, in order to support them from an energy perspective and I've got an example on silage here on the slide about 15 pounds of corn silage per head per day substitutes about a third of pasture acreage normally needed so you know, if you had a 100-acre pasture, you could cut that by a third and, and replace it by uh, 15 pounds of corn silage per head. Uh, a little bit of hay might be necessary, especially if you have very, very lush pasture. Think about right now in the springtime, especially those of you who maybe have some really lush ryegrass uh, coming in early in the season. Cows really love that stuff, uh, or you got a higher amount of legumes in your pasture, uh, you might need to feed a little bit of hay to help control bloat uh, and minimize that risk out there. Cows will consume whenever that 
grass tastes great. They'll eat as much as they can. And sometimes it's so lush that you'll have cows bloat on it. And we certainly want to avoid that. And offering just a little bit of free choice dry hay will help minimize that risk. And cattle will go kind of uh, regulate that themselves also because they'll have a little belly ache and they'll feel like the that dry hay helps control that. So they will help uh, transition that way themselves. We're going to talk about creep feeding a little bit more later, but if you have situations where pasture is not adequate or not enough adequate feed, it might be a great idea from a uh, nutritional support perspective to creep feed your cattle that way, um, or creep feed your calves. That will provide them a, another outlet to gain nutrition other than just uh, from pasture and whatever feed that, that mom provides. So um, creep feed plays a role that way, and we're going to talk about that more later in this slide set. And then lastly, I would say just manage your pasture effectively. If you do have enough pasture space and stocked properly, uh, keep those annual and perennial weeds out of there. Fertilize uh, appropriately on an annual basis or even more often than that. Uh, make sure that you, know, you consider rotational grazing in order to more effectively graze more area in your pasture make them graze it more evenly that helps control weeds that helps uh, increase your stocking density your stocking rate how many more ca how many more cows that you can put on an acre of land uh, especially if you look at southern illinois here where we're in competition with row crop producers and we have some ground that certainly is very very suitable for pasture but you want to maximize the efficiency of that and so good rotational grazing plan and then good pasture management meaning keeping your weeds maintained and keeping a good blend of grasses out there will increase your profitability. Let's talk about summertime and supporting those cows out there. Again, supplemental feed when pasture is not available. If you think about, uh, again, here in, in the local area, Clinton, Washington, Marion counties in the 618 area code, you know, we're going to have a few months of the year, um, let's just say four or five or even six, depending on what your pasture might look like, where there's just not enough feed out there available in the pasture uh, through the cold winter months. So you need to have some plan to fall back onto to in order to support those cows. So manage that weight loss. And fall, those fall calving cows, they will, don't, don't forget, they will burn energy in order to stay warm. So we don't want them to lose more than 15% of their body weight that they had at calving time. So that might be, you know, 120, 150 pounds, something in that range. So if they lose more than that, we've not, we've not done our job nutritionally. So they may need a little bit of supplemental energy in the form of corn or corn silage and a, and a dab of supplemental protein. But uh, cows that are in good body condition, and I would encourage you to really examine and study how to properly body condition, score your cattle, uh, that will help you manage stress more effectively. One of the key things to look at is lower critical temperature. That is what, a, uh, what temperature spot at which heat or cold stress becomes a problem. And that's 20 degrees for beef cattle out there. So you really want to think about whenever the temperature needle hits 20 degrees or lower, we got to start supplementing a little extra energy to those cattle because then they're going to start burning energy for heat and to heat themselves. And so every uh, increased feed 1% one, 1 for every degree below 20. So if you get to 10, uh, 10 below zero you, or 10 below 10 uh, degrees above freezing, uh, you want to have 10% more energy in that ration. Or if you get to zero around here, which it occasionally does, it hasn't this winter time very often, but if you get to zero, uh, you should probably have 20% more uh, energy in your feed. Urea should be utilized and is utilized if you look at many of your feed tags, in, whether you buy bagged feed at the store that's carrying a little bit of protein or those protein tubs uh, or mineral tubs that we talked about earlier. Urea should be used um, freely here uh, because this is a very, very cheap protein source and it's very effective and, and works quite well in those lick tubs or a lick tank uh, with molasses carrying it that it works quite well as a supplemental protein source and like we say it's very chemically effective and then we think about maybe some additional forage supplementation again be careful here you don't have to buy the highest quality hay you don't have to have the highest quality feeds um, some producers get wrapped up into really feeding some expensive things in a cow calf situation and i suppose that's up to you as a producer what you prefer 
but you drive by some fields and see cattle out there in the winter time grazing on corn stalks and you think well why how in the world would they have enough to eat uh as long as there's plenty of fodder out there the, those um bits of stalk and especially the old corn leaves that are out there and a little bit of grain that gets through the combine there's generally enough feed out there if there's enough space for them um, so you don't have to have excessively high quality and very expensive feeds keep your costs down that's the point i'm trying to make you want to keep your break-even costs as low as possible here um, in order to be cost effective and beef cattle are one of the best and most adept at converting a very low quality feed into something quite useful nutritionally that they can pass on to their calf or make do for themselves you know they cattle can convert straw and and, and still hang in there sometimes in really poor quality fescue hay uh, and they can hang in there sometimes so you have to be cognizant of what's out there and what's available uh, don't get too carried away in expense when we talk about those beef cows out there Next, let's talk, talk about the calf crop and a real basic ration. Of course, they're going to be nursing and consuming milk. And then as they get into maybe uh, two, three, four months of age, they're going to start picking a little bit of pasture or maybe a little bit of forage or hay that you might be uh, supplying out there. But that's real question is. I said we'd come back around and talk about creep feeding. And I have a very basic little statement here that says only the calves should get it. And that sounds very obvious. And why would you feed it to anything else? But trust me when I tell you that creep feed, if you've not smelled it, smells like candy often to cows. Uh, smells like candy to you and I. It's very, very attractive. Uh, think about mom at home putting nice uh, home-baked cinnamon rolls in the, in the oven and how that smell wafts through the house. Uh, that, same very, that very same thing that happens in the pasture once you put creep feed out there. It smells like that cinnamon roll in the house that you can now smell in your nose, I hope. And so those cows will do everything that they can in order to get to the creep feed. And they will eat as much as possible uh, whenever they get there. So you really want to have a system available that only the calves are able to get to the creep feed and consume it. And if you let cows in there to get at it, it's going to cost you a lot of money because they will eat a lot of it and they will probably gain more weight than you want them to and your feed bill is going to get quite high. So make sure that you have a system in place that only the calves are able to get at and consume the creep feed. A couple advantages listed here in terms of creep feeding. Certainly heavier calves. I mean, we should talk about 30 to 50 pound heavier calves at weaning time. Uh, improved body condition and improved uniformity of your group. And then if we have issues with weight loss by cows, which is what I mentioned earlier, uh, creep feed will help minimize weight loss by your cows if you're having issues there. Big disadvantages here. We got some extras that, of course, are going to come into play. It's going to take more labor. You've got to be out there managing that or pay somebody to manage that for you. It's going to take more time. Certainly, you've got to have some equipment, some kind of feeder system, um, or maybe even a facility here in order to make sure that your calves can get access to the creep feed. You've certainly got to buy the feed. Uh, that's, got to, that's got to be something that you invest in. And it's going to cost you more money than if you just left it alone. And then it takes some management expertise. You've got to be watching what they're consuming. You've got to be picking a good quality product. You've got to be uh, measuring if, they're, if it's actually effective or not uh, in order to know whether it's worth the investment. And obviously then higher feed cost in total. It, it drives your break-evens on those calves that are, that are going to be offered for sale to the finishing lot or at the sale barn. It's going to drive your break-evens higher. So it increases your cost on that calf. You might find some animals that actually put on too much weight. You say, well, how, how can that be true? Uh, they can't gain too much weight. You might have some producers that, that want the opportunity uh, to put on, put on the right amount of weight for calves and may pass on calves that are too heavy. And it may also mask the mothering ability of a cow. You say, well, what, what does that exactly entail? Uh, you may have some really poor genetics in your herd that creep feeding covers up. If that cow isn't nursing a calf long like she should and you're creep feeding, you may not know that that's actually happening. And you may keep a cow with poor genetics in the herd that doesn't raise actually good calves herself. Uh, she raises good calves because you creep feed. That That's something to consider 
out there genetically, nutritionally, and then economically on your farm. So really consider those types of things. Creep feed rations are 80 to 90% cereal grains, and a lot of that is uh, things that are very high de highly digestible, like finely ground corn, uh, oats, and things of that nature. Almost always you'll find uh, a pretty high amount of molasses in that feed, maybe some whey protein. And then a 10% of some kind of oil meal or commercial supplement in there. And there's some a table reference here, uh, again, in your book, Table 8.8, that gives you some ideas in terms of creep feed, makeup, and so forth. But um, if you're going to go in here and invest in creep feed, uh, invest in something that's worthwhile. Invest in a good quality product, I would recommend, because it will make it worth it. It will pay you back. Because, again, here's your target. 30 to 50 pounds at weaning time, heavier calf. So if you wean typically 600-pound calves, you better be weaning, I would argue, on the high end of that scale to make it effective. You need to be weaning 650-pound calves. It takes about 8 to 10 pounds of creep feed. That's the rule of thumb to get an extra pound of gain. Uh, on those caps so you know really think about whether it's worth it push the pencil i'm not saying not to do it if you're getting that impression you're wrong i'm not necessarily endorsing it if you're getting that impression you're wrong i've had many students over the years that love creep feeding and do it every year and i've had many students over the years that uh, don't creep feed and don't agree with that approach and and they get by just fine it really comes down to your management preference what makes you the most money as a producer what fits best in each year situation i think might be the best approach some years you may need to creep feed and some years you may not it's really uh being a good manager determines whether you should be creep feeding or not in my opinion if you want to know when you're going to get the greatest responses is when you have poor quality pasture or poor quality feed available. That's when that's when it will give you its biggest payback. And if you have those situations, seriously consider creep feeding because it will work. It also does give you the opportunity to get a feed additive like Remensen or Bovatec or Decox in your feed that might uh, increase feed efficiency and help feed those rumen bugs so that those calves grow at a more efficient rate. Uh, or maybe even add something in there like an antibiotic early on if you or a uh, uh, oxytetracycline or an areomycin if uh, you have um, you know wavering temperatures up and down you know, when we get 20 and 30 degree swings in temperature sometimes in the spring and fall in southern illinois here that can cause a great deal of stress to your calves so that might be an opportunity to get uh, get some a feed additive into your into your calves If you're in animal science, we mentioned implants a little bit. In about 60 to 90 days, you might be throwing an implant uh, onto those calves. And then, again, another way to boost weaning weight. Uh, be sure not to do that to heifers if you're going to plan on re uh, recycling them into your breeding herd. Uh, that's a testosterone product generally, so uh, that doesn't work too well if you're going to plan on, on breeding heifers. But, again, another management choice, in my opinion, that um, if you have a good quality ration, maybe you don't need it. Uh, if you have a good quality ration, maybe it magnifies it. If you have a poor quality ration, it might help it along and supplement a little bit. Or if you have a poor quality ration, it might hide the fact that you just need to have a better ration program. So you have to really, again, consider that as a producer, that uh, uh, investment in implants. It adds to your cost. So decide on whether that's the right move economically. Weaning time at about six to eight months of age, and there's a few uh, cases listed here for, for earlier weaning time, especially when you talk about first calf heifers, you know, slowing down the stress on that cow and maybe getting that cow cycling a little bit sooner. Maybe fall calves, uh, you know, get them, get them weaned maybe a little bit sooner to reduce feeding expense through the winter time on those cows. Uh, bull calves, maybe you want to get them separated from the herd, get them heavy enough and get them sold uh, sooner. It weaning basically at weaning time though just get those calves away from the cows uh, no further contact that will help the cow dry off quickly no none of this intermittent stuff you let them in the nurse for a couple days and then take them away and let them in the nurse for a couple days and take them away it's that's just not very effective on the cow or the calf either one so just simply remove them and they'll be just fine. Uh, if you're, This might be a little transitional time. If you don't want to creep feed all the time, this might be a good time to just offer a little bit and transition through that weaning time and minimize stress a little bit as much as possible. So 
we're going to classify some calves here uh, in in terms of talking about what you might do nutritionally uh, in order to make the most bang for your buck, uh, maybe get the most return on your investment. And the first one we talk about is preconditioned calf calves, and that's preparing a feeder calf for the feedlot. And so there's some mandatory things listed here. Uh, those calves should be weaned and started on feed for about a month prior to being offered at the sale barn or for shipment to the feedlot. And hopefully you've corresponded with a nutritionist at the feedlot or the feedlot producer that you're feeding something very similar to them. Uh, all those steers should be castrated and dehorned if necessary, uh, dewormed and treated for grubs no less than three weeks prior to shipment, and then they should be vaccinated for the number of things that are listed there. We want, we want those calves on the highest health plane possible no less than three weeks from sale time. Some optional things, uh, dewormed, maybe some lepto or BVD or haemophilus, again, all three weeks prior to sale time so that if they're stressed and go off feed for a little bit, they'll come back and be ready to go. And uh, owned by the seller or the same person at least 60 days prior to sale. That way we minimize the risk of commingling steers and having health issues that way. So calves hopefully are in better health. They're very efficient. And you should get 3 to $5 premium per hundred weight uh, for these calves. So if the typical uh, stocker or backgrounded calf that we're going to talk about in a second brings, you know, $100, uh, $100 a hundred weight or a dollar a pound, uh, these might bring a dollar three, a dollar five, um, or more per pound uh, premium for those for those calves that are preconditioned and ready to go. the uh, The idea or the concept is is those calves will hit the feedlot, never miss a beat, and go right to gain and weight right away. Stocker calves are weaned, weaned calves that are forage fed prior to sale time, so they've already been introduced to in that nature they're carrying very little finish at that maybe 600 700 800 pounds body weight um, we may have wintered them on some high roughage diets they've maybe been out there on corn stalks with mom uh, something of that nature maybe a little bit of grain or grass small grain grass pasture that rye grass pasture um, shoot the, there's a number of things that stocker calves could have done but notice missing here is no deworming uh, no vaccinations, not necessarily any um, orders in terms of they must be uh, castrated or anything in terms of stocker calves. So generally there's going to be more work put in by the finishing feedlot buyer so they're going to pay less for them at, at sale time. Backgrounded calves are weaned calves that have been brought up to dry lot and pasture. They've been put on a, a bit of a ration so they've been maybe pushed a little bit harder than a stocker calf they on on a little bit of forage feeding and probably some grain trying to get them up to that 800 pounds body weight before sale to the finisher so they've them a little bit more and maximize genetic potential again notice that you didn't see any on that slide anything in terms of vaccinations castration uh day requirements or anything like that Let's talk real briefly uh, about replacement heifers. And I, here comes the creep feeding topic again. And we say it's debatable. You know, it is again worth the investment? Can you separate your, your heifer calves out, your replacement heifers, and creep feed them in order to increase genetic expression? Or is it just not simply worth the higher cost that's listed here? Development wise, uh, we should get them to. Here's a few benchmarks. And I'll, I'll preface this with saying here's a few benchmarks for replacement heifers nutritionally that we should be thinking about meeting nutritionally and management wise. They should be 55 to 65 percent of mature weight at 15 months of age if we want them to calve at two years old. So if you have a thousand pound typical mature weight animal uh, she better weigh 550 to 650 pounds at 15 months of age if you want her to be ready to calve at two years old um, puberty is driven by body weight not by age so you have to be real careful that you are watching that because if your heifers are behind in weight uh, gain and not not gaining effectively and it takes them till 18 months or, or 20 months in order to get to that 650 pounds body weight example, they're not going to calve. There's no possible way that you're going to get very many of them to calve at two years old. They're just not, not uh, heavy enough to be fertile at, at uh, 15 months of age. 
that's your goal. Post weaning gains, so to give you a guideline between seven and 15 months of age, you know, they should be gaining between three quarters and a pound and a quarter per head per day. Now, we don't want to get too crazy and, and push it to that two, two and a quarter, two and a half, uh, like you're going to do with your steers. You're going to push them a lot higher. The heifers, we want to kind of moderate that because we don't want to get heifers too fat um, because you'll cause reproductive issues there. So, uh, as is mentioned at the bottom of the slide there, you know, low gains delays pre puberty, high gains um, makes it makes for reproductive issues. And actually you start to develop a fat pad in the mammary system, which will decrease milk potential. Now you have may have great genetics. If you have poor, poor feeding management through this time, uh, you can have really a lot of problems. And we can talk about that more in discussion section. So have some questions ready with related to replacement heifer development. Post weaning time, that weaning ration, we can we can have uh, some free choice hay out there available and free choice mineral. It's going to take roughly about three to four pounds of grain per head per day, probably if you're feeding some, uh, to get them to four and a, four and a quarter to five hundred pounds body weight. A winter ration, you know, a pound a pound and a quarter a day gain to reach six to seven hundred pounds. Uh, you know, what might we adjust and why? Always watch body condition. I, I put that question in here to reinforce always watch body condition on your on your heifers and steers, on your cows. Uh, that is the best barometer I can recommend for evaluating just by vision whether your feeding program is working or not. Pasture is really adequate for yearling heifers. We want them to gain about a pound to a pound and a half per day. Let's say, for example, from May to mid-July to hit that breeding weight target at 15. Bred heifers then can be managed basically just like the cow herd, uh, gaining again about a pound or a pound and a quarter from 900 to say 1,100 pounds, for example, at calving time. And then for those first calf heifers, you know, feed them pretty liberally. Treat them the best you can. If they are separate from the older cows, that's even better. But if they're not, uh, keep an eye on those first calf heifers. They're probably going to get bullied a little bit in the feedlot uh, out there in the feed yard or the pasture. They're going to be uh, last in the social order. So make sure that you watch those first calf heifers so that they recover from calving, start gaining weight and breed back, and, and can calve early in the next calving season. If you raise bulls, just a little few comments here on that. Uh, young bulls is a good opportunity. If you make money selling bulls to neighbors and other, other producers, it's probably a good investment to creep feed. Get them on full feed, high energy rations uh, to get them weaning you know, up there 12 to 14 months of age and ready, ready to service by the time that they're 15 to 18 months of age. So, you know, feed it about 2.5% of body weight dry matter, uh, get you about 2.5 pounds a day average. At about 15 months, then to three years of age, they're probably going to gain between a pound and three quarters and two and a quarter pounds average daily gain. So again, feed maybe 2% of body weight. You're going to probably increase the amount of roughage in the diet here for a couple reasons. Uh, number one, you need to moderate the cost here a little bit. It's going to get too expensive. Number two, increase the amount of roughage here uh, in order to moderate that body weight gain. Otherwise, they will those uh, bulls will get big and way too heavy on you and as mature bulls you know three years age of age and older they will just pasture with your cow herd more than likely unless you have a reason to keep them separated um, they can they can basically take off on the same ration as your grazing cows out there winter time about a half a pound per grain per 100 pounds body weight especially during breeding time if they're servicing at all and then adjust if you're feeding corn silage adjust if you notice body weight loss uh, same thing in the supplement in the summertime. Uh, watch watch those bulls as they're out there with the cow herd. Uh, only supplement energy if they, it's really needed to maintain condition. Bulls will again just like cows, but with a different mission. Uh, they will sacrifice body weight in order to service cows uh, during breeding time. So if they're busy breeding cows they'll forget to eat for a little while and, and lose body weight. And as, as they lose body weight, uh, semen concentration goes down and you'll have fewer pregnancies. Some general information as we talk about finishing cattle and certainly maybe the biggest topic uh, of this slide set is how do, we, how do we finish those steers increasing muscle and fat mass, produce that great quality steak that you like to eat uh, maybe on Saturday night. Um, 
market those steers between a year and two years of age somewhere over a thousand pounds now again that depends on what what breed or or cross breed that you have what that commercial finished market weight target is you'll find a lot of them in this area 1200 pounds um, 1300 pounds if you've got dairy beef those Holstein steers out there market maybe at 1400 pounds it just really depends on what you want those uh, want that marbling what that meat to look like at finish time crude protein ranges of feeding is somewhere between 9 and 14 percent varying with age size uh, amount of finish etc I would say nines are a little on the low end and 14 is plenty uh, so somewhere in the middle there is probably about right pretty high concentrate diets at this point in time we should be looking at maybe a 65 75 85 percent TDN diet uh, very efficient gainers and so you have to be you have to be a little bit of willing to take a risk here and willing to push your finishing cattle and I say maybe prone to metabolic disorders you almost have to think about we're going to tow right up to the line of making a steer sick metabolically uh, whether it's displaced abomasums or ulcers or um, fatty liver problems hopefully uh, none of those are an issue but you basically want to walk that steer right up to the to the line of having metabolic problems and that's where those steers will gain most efficiently it sounds maybe funny or or daredevilish to say that but that's where you get your highest returns on investment is if you can get those steers gaining uh, at very very high rates for as, as uh, fast as you can for as, sh as short a period as possible that makes your that means you're going to turn steers faster you're going to make more money in a more efficient way so really focus that a number of times some guidelines on calcium and, fe and uh, phosphorus feeding here and a good rule of thumb is two parts calcium to every one part phosphorus that's changed a little bit and I'll say there's a big focal point on phosphorus feeding there's huge amounts of data now being developed that that phosphorus feeding levels out there in the feedlots are two three four five six times higher than they really need to be based upon NRC requirements so I would encourage you don't get too crazy in your phosphorus feeding levels uh, follow what NRC says and if you can back them down even farther than that that will minimize your environmental impact and the risk of phosphorus uh, you know running off into your waterways and polluting the environment so uh, keep that under control don't get carried away with uh, with your phosphorus levels estimating feed intake I would push them here it says two to three percent of body weight dry matter I would push them to that three plus side as a percent of intake on body weight uh, dry matter if we're talking 400 pound plus calves uh, so really really monitor that know what av what they're consuming on an av average uh, daily basis uh, to see if we're reaching that 3% of body weight or above. So full feed essentially is about 2 pounds of grain per 100 pounds body weight plus supplement and forage. Now if you want to talk about corn silage feeding, um, it takes higher intakes obviously because we have water in the ration then. There are several producers here locally that do use corn silage to finish their steers. Uh, as long as it's processed very fine, um, it will work. It, it works just just fine, especially if it's there's, if there's a lot of grain content in it. So it, it works just fine. It protects the rumen, so that we don't maybe have some rumen acidosis issues like we were, you know, referencing in the last slide. Uh, so that that's certainly a possibility. Don't eliminate that out there. But if if that's not a feed that's available to you, there are. So we can look at roughage to concentrate ratio here, and that's referencing 15 to 85 there. That means 15% roughage, 85% concentrate. And I know guys that are at 10 and 90 and 5 and 95. Uh, you can get by with very, very, very low rates of, of uh, forage feeding and then feeding just simply whole shelled corn. Uh, whole shelled corn will somewhat in the room and mimic a bit of a forage for steers it it's kind of a bit of a phenomenon but boy you can get steers to gain extremely extremely uh, efficiently and it says here corn is the most profitable at two dollars to two dollars and fifty cents a bushel whoa scary number if you talk about being a row crop producer out there um, I would say the economics of that have changed that's a bit of an old number I probably should update here on the slide I leave it in there to kind of reference that that's kind of a historical uh, number that if corn got above two dollars and fifty cents finishing feedlot guys were gonna look for a different feed 
I would say in today's marketplace, uh, add a dollar or so to that because corn's still going to be in play. It's still the most profitable. We can process it a number of different ways. So faster gains go with higher energy rations. So basically intake is somewhat regulated by the energy content or energy density of the ration. If you can make your ration very, very energy dense, uh, it, will be, it will be somewhat uh, regulated. That steer will regulate himself on how much he, he, he will eat on a daily basis. All right, when we talk about nutritional management uh, of finishing cattle, how to, how to get those steers done efficiently, starting them on feed as you transition steers into the feedlot, the first thing is you got to minimize disease. Mortality and morbidity rates need to be very, very low at that time. So make sure that anything uh, that you're offering them to eat in that pin when they first hit your feedlot is extremely, extremely palatable. Probably a good idea to have some high roughage there probably a good idea to get with your veterinarian and have some antibiotic in that feed um, but it may take as little as five days and as much as three weeks to uh, for those steers to adjust uh, depending on how many different uh, sources they came from depending on the envi environment and the feed you may have all kinds of outbreak of disease there um, which we want to avoid as much as possible. So make sure if you're bringing steers in into your feedlot, make sure you focus on that first, let's say month or so uh, of transitioning those steers into your feedlot. That will pay you back a great deal along the way uh, because we don't want steers to not gain or not gain very efficiently early on in their time in the feedlot. The grow finish rations, again, we're going to maintain feed intake without stomach upsets. We're going to go right up there to the line of acidosis and then park it there if we can. Uh, as long as we don't cause sick illness, that, that's right where we should be. You can go with a single phase program, meaning we're going to feed the same feed from the time that they hit the feedlot or the transition pen, come out of the transition pen onto your finished program all the way to... Um, to market or you can go to a two-phase program like what's listed here maybe 50 to 60 percent concentrate early on and then 75 percent plus concentrate in that second phase with little to no forage but uh, make sure don't short them on crude protein i mentioned that i would hit right in the middle of the range that we mentioned on a previous slide uh, that protein content should be pretty natural uh, and or a little bit of npn now, if you talk about specific amino acid feeding, they're still working on some research on that in terms of what amino acids uh, we should be offering steers in order to minimize crude more money. Some miscellaneous things here, some non-nutritive feed additives. You know, I mentioned antibiotics. You know, We talked about that in, in uh, detail in Unit 5. You say, well, what might we feed and what do they do? Well, we might be interested in feeding something like rumensin uh, in your finishing feedlot that helps increase uh, feed efficiency. We might need to put something like oxytetracycline in that transition pen uh, in order to decrease the amount of um, respiratory problems that your steers might have as they hit the feedlot. You might need to feed, again, something like uh, aureomycin or oxytetracycline and creep feed to those calves in order to decrease the amount of, uh, of respiratory problems that you may have uh, with weather changes and so forth. Uh, basically, anything that protects the animal and uh, decreases mortality and morbidity rates is very, very important uh, in feeding. And now, of course, you have to have uh, veterinary feeding directives to do that. So make sure you work closely with your uh, local veterinarian in order to know what to do. MGA is listed here. If you've got uh, heifers in your finished lot that are not going to be breeding animals, melangestrol acetate is what that stands for, will actually inhibit the estrus behavior and uh, decreases estro uh, estrogen production. So that will make your animals so that they don't go through heat cycles and be running around your feedlot and running off all the average daily gain that you're hoping to put on them. Ionophores, I mentioned things like rumensin, um, decox or bovatec are ionophores that will help increase feed efficiency. And you might offer something like a sodium bicarbonate or a buffer out there in order to make sure that uh, we don't have ruminant acidosis problems. Some bloat prevention things might come into play here if we've got cows on pasture. Uh, hopefully we have got no more than 50% legume, like no more than 50% clover in your pasture. That will help make sure that we don't have some uh, bloat problems uh, out there in your pasture. About something like a, a um, 
Uh, a dewormer would be very important at least twice a year. I would recommend at this point in time before they hit the pasture in the spring and when they come off in the fall, um, some kind of dewormer would be a great idea uh, in order to increase your health uh, plane. Uh, provide a little bit of dry roughage if you tend to have bloat issues. A little paloxylene and some ionophores will help with that as well. But there's a number of things that you can do to help from a feed additive perspective. Take home messages here when we talk about uh, wrapping up our beef cattle section here. When we talk about cow and calf guys, support those cows nutritionally so that they're gaining weight slightly uh, at breeding time. Again, I can't emphasize enough, watch body condition. That will tell you. You don't need to be an expert in nutrition to watch that. If they lose too much body weight, you've got a nutritional problem more than likely or a health problem or both. Maximize effectiveness of your pasture. We talk about that uh, a number of times, a number of ways. Really work on improving your skill in that area. Remember, lower critical temperature is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, so support with additional energy when it's cold. Again, 1% for every degree below 20 degrees increase in energy uh, uh, offered to those ca uh, cows and calves out there. Consider the economics of creep feeding. We talked about that in a number of different slides in a number of different ways. There are some advantages and some disadvantages that we listed, but really as a producer, push the pencil. Um, some of you don't creep feed because you've never cre uh, never used creep feed and, and you think it's a crutch. Go push the pencil and, and think about trying it sometime. See if it works for you. Those of you who have who generally always creep feed and you maybe have never thought about the economics of it, uh, consider whether it's worth it. Um, consider, push the pencil and see if economically do you really need to have that in the ration. So I, I would encourage you both, uh, those types of producers out there, if you're a nutritionist helping those producers, a potential veterinarian helping producers, really consider the economics of creep feeding and if and when it fits in your, in your diet plan. Look at lots of dis different rap ration options to optimize uh, average daily gain. Are there feed additives uh, or, or feed byproducts like candy waste or bakery waste or dry distiller's grains that might be replacements for a ration component in order to cheapen and optimize the economic efficiency of your ration? Uh, really look at what's available out there and don't get too carried away on expensive ingredients. Finished rations should be extremely high grain content. If balanced properly, we should be pushing those steers right to the edge, and, and that will help us then do the last point on the slide, which is focus on maximum efficiency all the way through here. You want to keep your input costs as low as possible. You want your break-evens as low as possible, whether we're talking about cow-calf or steers. You want to keep that input cost down. There's just not enough margin to be made. Um, on most steers and calves and cow calf situations you want to keep that break even as low as you can so really focus your efforts on maximum efficiency maximum productivity in order to be a successful producer so that wraps up our section on on uh, beef nutrition here uh, there's quite a bit of management things weaved in uh, with us and when when it uh, with this uh, section when we come back to class i hope you bring lots of questions and and challenge us on to think about the uh, feeding options we're going to get into uh, the computer lab in this section and spend some time working on some computer ration balancing for beef cattle so be prepared for a pretty nice assignment i hope uh, that will reinforce what we've talked about here in the beef cattle section i'll look forward to seeing you in class uh, signing off on unit 7 beef cattle nutrition <music>